Welcome to Afra's Artifacts, where we do some archaeology of our own and dig into the queer side of Star Wars. I'm your host, Alia Morgane, and it's so great to have you here. I'm super excited about this week's episode, next week's episode, and the week after that, because we're talking about Sylvester Yarrow and Jordana Sparkburn. Today we're talking about Sylvester. Next week we're talking about Jordana, and the week after that, their relationship. And they are fabulous characters even by themselves but together they're just exponentially amazing um a couple things i want to get out of the way the legos are not gone the legos are in the other room i had to have some construction done on my house there was an issue dealing with that so i had to clear out the legos sadly <laughs> but they will be back um also, I went to Dragon Con last week and it was fantastic, wonderful, amazing, everything positive. Um, I was on four panels talking about all kinds of cool Star Wars stuff, including the High Republic, which these characters are from. Also, finding yourself in Star Wars, so I got to talk all about Star Wars queerness. We also dug into body image, age, and women representation in Star Wars. And it was a blast. Um, and then I competed for the fifth year in a row in the Dragon Con Star Wars Trivia Competition, and I won again! So two years in a row. Hopefully I'll get a third. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, today we're talking about Sylvester Yarrow. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about her personality and her physicality and then we'll get into some of the story that takes place in the book where she's introduced that is called Out of the Shadows and it's written by Justina Ireland. Um, and then we'll get into what her perception of the Jedi is because that's a super important thing in Star Wars. How does the everyday average person perceive the Jedi? So we're going to get into all that. So to get started, Sylvester Yarrow is 18 years old. She is a hauler, and her ship is called the Switchback. She inherited it from her mother, who was killed in an attack by the Nile. Supposedly. Um, she has a crew of a Celestin named Nito Jana Jana and a droid named N227, and she's in severe debt. She's doing everything to can to everything she can to keep her ship up and running, um, keep her crew living, and she's just broke as anything. Um, she does carry around with her her trusty blaster, which she has named Betty, and she's a vegetarian. She always felt intensely guilty after eating any kind of meat. She also has a quite a temper, which her mother used to tease her about, saying. You're more tenacious with a grudge than a salubrian jungler with a bone. One cool thing about her personality is that she's able to adapt really well to all sorts of crazy situations. The only situation she's not able to adapt to is the one that she deals with in this book, where she is thrust into the lap of luxury and all these crazy, weird, secret, ultra-rich backhanded deals that were going on. Um, she's not used to any of that. But as the narrative says, usually she could suss out the rules of a place and adapt. It was how she had come to understand several languages, including Shiree Wook. Pretty cool. She knows Shiree Wook. But it says this as well. Give her a broken compressor, pirates, and a risky flight plan, and she was fine. But dealing with government officials? and fleecing the ultra-rich apparently sent her to absolute pieces. Physically, her skin was dark and her kinky hair was a cloud around her head. She wore simple blue mechanics coveralls and she seemed much larger than she was. Emery, a Padawan, towered over her and she was even a few centimeters shorter than Vernestra, Emery's master, if not for her hair. And yet Vernestra had the feeling she would be formidable in a fight. Now, to go along with this, according to Vernestra, reading Syl's mind would be next to impossible. 
Her will is much too strong. And then a quick little line of trivia. She enjoys hollows, including one called Love on the Rift. Sounds like something I would enjoy. Um, so as for the story, as for what happens in the book, she's on the switchback with Nito and M227, and the ship gets pulled out of hyperspace in the Beringi sector, and Nile come to attack. And she, Nito, and the droid must run away in an escape pod, which leads her, leads Silvestri, to go to Coruscant, where she tries desperately to get officials in, in the Republic to listen to her about the hyperspace anomaly. But no one will have any of it. No one respects her. No one will listen to her. Everyone thinks she's crazy or just doesn't even matter. And she so, she doesn't know what to do. She's just, she's lost. Um, she's also, at the same time, weirdly constantly worried about running into her ex-girlfriend, Jordana, which I don't quite understand because Jordana, as she knows, is on Taike, which we will get into much more in a couple weeks. She's even the um, victim of an assassination attempt on her life by a Mon Calamari male who invades the fancy hotel room that a man named Xylan Graf sets her up in. Um, so Xylan is a big part of her story in this book. He's a member of a super ultra rich family and he's really sneaky, he's not completely honest, but he promises her credits in a new ship. She can't turn him down. She has to do what he says because she needs it. Her ship is gone. Her mother's dead, she thinks. Her crewmates need things to live. Um, she's, she's heartbroken. She's in such a bad place. She just needs something, something to lift her up out of the doldrums that she is in. So what Silen wants her to do is lie about her ship being pulled out of hyperspace into the Berengi sector. And she's been trying, like I said, unsuccessfully to convince Republic officials of exactly the opposite. But does doing this make her a bad person? Or is she just looking out for the people closest to her? Is she just downtrodden enough that this is the only answer she can see? The only way out of her terrible situation? I don't think she's a bad person. I think she's a lovely human being who's between a rock and a hard place and doesn't know what else to do. So at the end of the story, she discovers that her mother is alive and is in fact working with the Nile and Silvestri is stomping mad about it. And her mother's like a completely different person. Her mother was, yes, stern and brash, but she was also loving in her own way. Well, this mother, this Chansey Yarrow, I did not raise you to be soft, Sylvester Yarrow. I am taking my ship and getting out of here before this place is completely destroyed. I taught you to be a survivor. This is your last chance to make the right decision. Ugh. She... Mm. Her mother is off her rocker and it's check out my review of this book out of the shadows on the stars .com for more information about her mother because she's a doozy. Um, the review for this book will be released tomorrow. So be sure and check that out. Um, as for uh, Sylvester's feelings about the Jedi, well, she's growing to seriously dislike them. Um, when she first sees Vernestra and Emery in Senator Staros's office, which is the beginning of the crazy journey she goes on that's the majority of the book, um, its narrative says that she had a feeling somewhere between awe and anger flowed through Sil. What were the Jedi doing on Coruscant instead of out on the frontier fighting the Nile? Everyone knew that the Jedi had powers far beyond anyone else with their mysterious force. Not 
Not to mention plasma swords that could cut through just about anything and also repel blaster bolts. It seemed ridiculous that they should be here, waiting to help Xylan Graf claim rights to the Barangi sector rather than fighting back the Nile. So she comes from a place of, a place that I completely understand. She's thinking, we need an army to fight this grave threat. And the Jedi are a standing army. In reality, they are. Um, now, they're very dogmatic about how they go about things. And they want to follow the code. And they're all strict about how they deal with bad people. And sometimes the answer is to, at least in this fantasy world, the best way to get rid of these marauders, these the worse than pirates, is to get rid of them. And the Jedi refuse to do it. The Jedi are like, oh, we can reform them. These aren't reformable people. <laughs> um, the Jedi... It's just a, it's a very interesting, sticky situation, and I totally get where Sylvester is coming from in her dislike for the Jedi for those reasons. Now, I do want to include this part because it's super, super cute, and it's just the most adorable lesbian thing ever. Um, so, when Sylvester, well, after she's dealt with her negative feelings towards Vernestra, then she thinks it bothered Syl that the girl was actually pretty cute. With her facial tattoos on the outside of each eye, Syl couldn't tell what the design was at this distance, but it had the effect of making her eyes seem larger than they were. Gah, she was not about to fall for a Jedi, was she? Maybe it was the blasted uniform. Get it together, Yaro. Just, it's so cute. It's so cute. And then she has another instance where when she first sees Senator Staros, um, that she talks about how if she wasn't already heartbroken, she would probably have a crush because she goes on and on about how gorgeous the woman is. I just love it. It's so cute. Um, so in the end of the story, Syl becomes the owner of the Vengeful Goddess, a very experimental graph ship laden with weapons and she when she gets asked if she wants to change the name she's like nope vengeful goddess for me and she and Jordana jump on the ship and sail into the horizon which we will get into in two weeks when we talk about their relationship so please comment down below what you think about Sylvester Yarrow um do you think what do you think about her moral conundrum um I'd love to know your thoughts so don't forget next week, Monday, 6 p.m. Central, we're talking about Jordana Sparkburn, her other half. And then the week after that, we're talking about their relationship. So remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Twitter at Alia Morgan, and peruse my blog at thestarwarsreview.blogspot.com. May the Force be with you.